in different religions as well, they do believe in some fasting as well. So especially in, I know in a community as well, Ramadan is also followed. The season of the season is coming up very soon, and this is very important. And a problem does come, especially for the patients. So there are those patients with diabetes or cardiac problems. So a lot of times they do come, and I do receive emails as well. What should be they doing? In fact, how should they be managing it? Well, in fact. So similarly, even the other followers as well. During a lot of times, whenever they are doing their fasting. So they have to take care of a lot of different things as well. So that's what that is the reason we try to take up this very important topic, and uh, we'll try to share what are those concerns. So as I was already telling you, fasting is advocated in a lot of uh, different religions as well. So there are a lot of benefits which is associated with the uh, this fasting as well. So I'll try to share you what are those. Benefits first of all. So, what are the benefits which is associated with fasting? So, as I said, it uh, it is already important. It tends to not only improve the metabolic function. In fact, it does help also in the loss of excessive weight or the water in the body as well. You know, you all are very much already aware of what is called as dieting. Okay, but this is not dieting. So. Fasting is done in terms of more of a, you know, spiritual thinking, in fact. So it has also been shown to improve the control for hypertension, to flush out the toxins, and also it strengthens the immune system, in fact. So a lot of times those people or those, our friends, colleagues as well, they come to us asking, you know, is it really good that what can be done? What is the best way? For example, if there is a diabetic, so one is having a problem. So how can we really help them? So we can try to combine this opportunity, I would say, you know, trying to get the spiritual benefit and also the physical benefit as well. Physical benefit when we are talking, as I said it, so it is for the metabolic control of the diabetes uh, through the weight reduction. And also, as I was telling you, for the spiritual benefits as well, I think a uh, lot of our Muslim colleagues or friends or students as well, or the audience which is there, which they can relate to it, in fact. So it has been prescribed even in the uh, Holy Quran as well, okay, and uh, in a lot of other religious books as well. So fasting definitely does have a spiritual connection as well. So as everything has its own pros and cons similarly even the fasting as well can be associated with some risks as well so what are the common risks which may be associated with fasting so we all are very much aware so what happens is they try to do a study when they try to see the plasma glucose levels it can be quite a lot related to different signs and symptoms so, for example, whenever there's a normal serum level, you know, so, and it, if it starts to go down, the, a person may suffer, especially a diabetic one, is more predisposed for the hypo or the hyperglycemia, even for dehydration, and of course for the weight changes as well. So, what happens is, whenever the serum plasma glucose level reaches around 90, around 4.6 millimoles per liter, the insulin secretion is gets inhibited in fact and when later on when it reaches 3.8 the glucagon or epinephrine or the growth hormone secretion is happening over there similarly what is called as around you know between six, uh, lesser than 60 the cortisol secretion happens cortisol secretion is also called as the stress hormone and someone may the person may start complaining of what is called as cognitive dysfunction. Cognitive dysfunction means the person will tell like they're not able to recognize, you know, they, are, they will be having some problems also in the speaking as well. And similarly, if it goes further down, less than 45, so patient will start to complain of lethargy. In fact, if it reaches the level of 30, 
mg per deciliter patient may not only develop coma but also may develop convulsions as well and of course if it reaches less than 15 it can not only cause permanent brain damage but also death as well so there are a lot of special precautions are recommended if uh, there is a diabetic patient uh, someone wants to do the fasting especially during Ramjan or their religious times as well so so what happens is as I was telling you they are they are supposed to see uh, the food should be taken according to the food time okay so and even the meal should be adjusted not just in the schedule in the amount and also the composition it, it happens because I know in some of the religions as well they don't even allow to eat certain kind of food okay in some kind of fasting so one kind of fasting is uh, the one especially during uh, Ramadan we are aware that nothing should be taken even the water as well uh, uh, you know. so for example what happens is if someone is planning for the meal as well so as I said it's schedule the amount of food the composition of meal also needs to be changed especially for a diabetic patient because you want to have avoid any complications complications the ones is like the hypoglycemia similarly during the daytime a person should try to reduce the physical activity and in fact if someone is uh, really has to do some physical exercise or exertional work and all it can be done but one hour after the iftar not just immediately after the iftar but at least after one around after the iftar so a lot of times a question comes is how about the calorie intake so for example uh, someone was taking around 2000 calories per day or 2500 uh, kilocalories uh, per day okay so what about the calorie intake so during the special time as well there's no need for changing for that okay so over here since now you are very much aware now since about all those things now I would like to try to introduce to you what is called as calorie restricted diet so what is calorie restricted diet is you're trying to reduce the calorie intake around 40 percent okay so when they try to the scientists have tried to see so they have seen it can increase the lifespan by almost 50 percent 50 percent you understand so for example if someone is having a life expectancy of like 60 or 70 years no so if you have reduced out the calorie intake by 40 percent almost 50 percent lifespan increase will be there and not just that so what is going to happen is it is going to also improve the overall cardiovascular risk profile by acting on several parameters several parameters including includes the decreasing the heart rate the blood pressure if in the total cholesterol serum triglyceride level if in the low density lipoprotein the LDL cholesterol which is the bad cholesterol as well and in fact also increases the good cholesterol okay so so that is why it causes an overall very very positive cardiovascular risk profile okay similarly it is also associated with increase in the insulin sensitivity and reduction in fasting glucose and insulin which tends to uh, an overall improvement in the glucose regulation as well in fact it has also been shown to prevent the occurrence and progression of wide spectrum chronic illness like the diseases like the hypertension autoimmune disease the kidney disease or even the neurodegenerative disease and cancer as well so yes the caloric restriction of the diet or the food intake is associated with a lot of benefits okay so now coming back to our mm, topic which we are dealing 
like the diabetes and the Ramadan. So as I you are very much aware that yes, fasting is indeed very very important. In fact, and diabetes mellitus is a chronic disease, right? And then what happens is it's a huge number, huge number of diabetics, okay, uh, who tend do the fasting even during this period, in fact, as well. And what has happened is uh, advancements has been happening. And quite a lot of advancement has happened, which can help the people in leading a normal life. So what tends to happen during this period? So as I was telling you, those patients, they do come and they will be asking all these questions as well. And the questions will be, is, for example, you know, those patients... The, there are basic questions. So, for example, like, can they first of all fast? Okay. And the risk or the benefits, which we have already been discussing as well. Then they also tend to ask, what about the diet and exercise? So, the questions we already answered as well. And then, can we adjust the drug dosages? And similarly, is it wise enough for the patient to monitor it during the fasting? So the big, biggest question always comes to our mind is, is it possible for fasting in fact, okay? So a lot of research has been going on. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, so we can ask some questions as well from our students who are uh, attending. Do you think, is it safe enough? Or, you know, what are the other... Th Do you think is it safe for the diabetic patients to fast? Yeah? So what do you say? No one? So, so there are a lot of uh, scientific data as well which has already said it yes it is safe for the diabetic patients but there are a lot of sometimes it can be problematic as well which I was talking about so what are those so what are those things which we all have to say so as I was telling you for a patient needs to be a little bit extra careful in the sense there needs to be a pre Ramadan assessment the pre fasting assessment because this is going to continue for several weeks you know and it's not just for a few days, in fact. There needs to be proper education of the patient. So what are the precautions one needs to take and all. And the management needs to be made aware. So then the biggest question comes is, what is the role of the physician? So what is the doctor's role for that? So the doctors, as I was telling you, so they have to guide and also advise those people, you know, to how to fast as safely as possible. Okay. So as I was telling you about the assessment, so assessment should be done. Assessment should be done, for example, of the glycemic status. So for example, how is the glycemic status of the patient? So for example, is it poorly controlled? Is it badly controlled? Then for example, about the complications and the comorbid conditions as well. So what are the problems someone is having and what about the comorbid conditions as well which are associated so for example one is having a retinopathy one is having a nephropathy one is having a neuropathy or <coughs> sorry so but what about those other comorbid conditions as well similarly you should also be able to assess someone's ability so for example like someone is lean and thin and uh, and they are pretty intolerant to hypoglycemia, okay? They are very symptomatic during the hypoglycemic episodes and all. 
it doesn't it make sense to ask them to better to avoid it right hmm? so can you name some conditions in which you should try you should advise okay you should advise a patient to better avoid fasting can you give me some examples so what are the conditions in which you will advise to better to avoid come on i do expect some answers as well No? So I will have to answer this, okay? So as I was telling you, there, there are a lot of uh, patients comorbid conditions as well, which we all have to be careful. And if someone is having all these kind of problems, so we should be advising them against it. Like try to tell them not to fast. So for example, about the diabetes, as I was telling, so if someone is having a renal problem, the renal problem like serum creatine is pretty high, or the you know someone is already having associated CKD, advanced CKD as well. So better to ask them to avoid it. So as I was already telling you about those complications as well. So for example, if someone is having a severe retinopathy, so you should of course advise them, you know, to better to avoid it. Similarly, then hypoglycemic unawareness unawareness as i was telling you so it happens like if someone is really old or some of those ladies patients or otherwise some of those uh, neuropathy patients as well so what will happen is even if they are having hypoglycemia they might not be so symptomatic and what may happen is the damage may happen to those people so for such kind of patients you should try to advise them not to fast similarly if someone is already having a major macrovascular disease as well okay or someone has had a recent dka diabetic ketoacidosis in fact as well or someone's random blood sugar if you try to do it and it was more than 300 okay or if someone really needs a lot of multiple insulin injections per day or yes of course, if someone is, uh, there's a female, you know, someone has to feed their babies as well. So, or they are pregnant. So, okay, these are the conditions in which you must say to them, okay, you're better, better to avoid it, in fact, okay. Close that uh, PC camera, doctor. This one, huh? Yeah. Close that. Yeah, click the uh, mute icon. The mic icon you can see. Hello. Name. Hello. Yeah, no. No. Yeah, this one. Yeah. No, no, nearby that. Nearby that. Yeah, click that. Can yeah. you please mute your voices? Okay. So, what about the other comorbid? Uh, if someone is so, these were the conditions which is related to diabetes. But other than diabetes as well, there can be a lot of other problems which is affecting the other organ systems, okay? And that as well, I would, not just I would, I would say the evidence, the scientific evidence as well, which is there, it tends to advise better not to fast. So what are the other systemic problems where it is advised not to fast? Can someone recall those things? The conditions. Come on, they are very simple situations. So for example, you are there in the other than these diabetes problem. What are the other systemic problems if someone is having? You will say them not to fast. 
So, so if someone is having like a acute ulcer, peptic ulcer, otherwise similarly, if the liver enzymes are raised by at least twice, more than twice, or if someone is having a severe psychiatric disease as well, or someone has had a recent myocardial infarction, okay? Otherwise, if someone is having a cancer, cancer with a poor general condition, similarly, if someone is having a recurrent stone formation, okay, and someone is having a very poorly controlled bronchial asthma or severe systemic or local infection as well, or similarly like the pulmonary tuberculosis is there as well. So, better to try to avoid it, okay. So, these are some of those conditions as well. Uh, which one should try to avoid it. So, but even after this, so what is happening is, you know, someone is really, really motivated that no, they want to do it, in fact. So, so what are you going to advise to those people, in fact? So, uh, as I said it, yes, uh, it, there are some good things as well. There, these are the problems which can be associated. And so, but what about those good things as well? So, good things... So what happens is, yes, um, a lot of times, as I was telling you, uh, the common things, what are the common things during the diabetes if someone is having? So diabetes, if someone is having some, sometimes they may be even developing the hyperglycemia as well. So about the hyperglycemia, what you try to do is, you must, so we already, what is called as an individualized medical therapy. Okay, what is called is there is a specialty of field which is already coming up, which is called as personalized medicine. So in this as well, you should try to individualize the care in the sense so that, uh, so what happens is uh, you should try to see for each person's individual needs. Okay, individual needs. So what are the things which you should be trying to take care is in the sense, what kind of diet they are having, what kind of fasting pattern you are having and you should try to similarly try to notice because what happens is the eating habit will be changed in many ways in terms of meal time will be changed, the pattern of meal will be changed and even the calorie intake is going to be uh, uh, differing in fact, okay. And that is the reason why uh, a lot of times what happens is because uh, it is better or to even, uh, and when we try to take care of the other things as well, we do notice because of uh, in the night times, you no, know, there's a lot of postprandial physical activity as well, okay. And then not just that, so what happens is due to the spiritual environment or the atmosphere during this month, so that also tends to cause a little bit of psychological changes, psychological changes in the terms of like, there'll be a feeling of inner well-being in fact, okay. So, whenever someone is fasting, you should try to suggest them a few things in the sense, a few things, what are the things we should be suggesting them? For example, for the pre, uh, what is called as pre-Ramadan medical assessment, you should try to get it done and educate them as well, okay? So, what are the things which the body is undergoing? through or passing through and what are the precautions they should be taking in fact as well and they should be advised to better to practice fasting uh, in the Shaban first actually okay and only when with the approval of the experienced good physician switch to either long acting or a twice daily medication in fact okay and then if someone there is an elderly patient or NSAID should have frequent monitoring of the renal functions because NSAIDs, NSAIDs, what is NSAID? So you can try to use the chat box. Huh? Okay, so there are so many of our students, young budding doctors who are there. So what is NSAIDs? Non -steroidal. Non -steroidal. Finally, I am so glad, okay. Uh, you all are awake. I was thinking I was not getting an answer. So, maybe the... Wonderful, right, right. So, 
they can be detrimental, especially to the kidney function as well. So that's why if someone is an elderly patient, so they are more fragile, especially their renal functions as well. So you need to be a little bit more cautious. You have to be monitoring them frequently, in fact. Similarly, if someone is on anticoagulants or antiplatelets, okay, so then what you should do is better to give those medicines at the night time. So these are the general advices which you have given. So now it comes to the education and counseling. So in the education part, what do you do? You educate not just the patient, but also their family members. Family members, what do you say is, try to explain them about the acute complications, which we already said it, and also their management. So for example, if someone develops a hypoglycemia, how are they, you going to help that person, or especially to their family relatives or their near and dear ones, or their, even their good friends as well. Similarly, how to monitor the blood sugar levels and then how to plan the meals accordingly. Similarly, as I already said to you about those two other important things is about the physical activity and also the drug adjustment, okay? How are they supposed to take care or adjust their drugs as well? Yeah, so education and counseling of the patient is very, very important in fact, okay? So similarly, um, so what had happened is uh, there are a lot of events as well. There are several studies which try to compare the benefits of education and counseling. Okay, there was a study which is called as a Reed study. So in that, when they tried to see for a group of patients who were educated, so what happened is, in fact, uh, the number of hypoglycemic events came down. In fact, the number of complications also uh, reduced so they whatever if I'm telling as well there is a scientific evidence for that okay so you can already uh, see the benefits over here okay the hypoglycemic events of course they tend to come down not just pre Ramadan even the post Ramadan as well so this has got a lot of benefits as well similarly when they try to see in those people who attended these counseling sessions, in fact, the mean weight was reduced. Okay, and otherwise they were, those patients as well, who in spite of doing the fasting, there was a weight gain as well. In fact, similarly, when they try to, those people who were, who underwent the education and counseling as well, in fact, the hypoglycemia events there was an overall reduction from 9 to 5 in fact. However, for example, from the control group, it increased, the number of hypoglycemia episodes increased in fact. Similarly, the HbA1c levels at 12 months, for example, for those patients who attended those education and counseling sessions, in fact, there was no significant effect. However, for those control group of patients, it increased. So what do you understand from the read study? So what do you understand from the read study? Can you summarize? Can someone summarize? So read study definitely shows there is huge benefit of education and counseling for the patient in not only on multiple parameters. Multiple parameters is in terms of hypoglycemic events. The number of hypoglycemic events come down. Similarly, the mean weight reduction also, there's a positive weight reduction as well, okay? Although on hemoglobin HbA1c, which is the glycosylated hemoglobin, it didn't cause much of change. Why it didn't cause much of change? Because Ramadan is not forever, right? It is just for a few weeks. So there is a definitely a big role for this. So now coming to a, another important question. What about the role of diet? Diet and exercise. Okay, we all are interested in diet because we are what we eat. And of course also is, there is a big role for exercise as well. 
So now coming to the diet part. So how shall we be taking care of the diet part? So we all need to keep it in mind is total calorie should not be changed. In fact, we should divide the food in two to three meals. And like if the dinner can be there, there can be a suhoor as well. Similarly, a lot of times it happens. Uh, whenever someone is fasting, they tend to take a lot of sweet food. So we would really like to advise better to limit the sweet food which is being taken especially at the iftar time. Similarly, the, the amount of fried food as well. So because they tend to think that okay they have taken they have been doing all the fasting during the whole day. So in the evening time, so when they are having the iftar, so you know they can eat the fried and junk stuff. No, that's not good. Especially eating a lot of fried food, oily food. When you someone is breaking the fast, no, it's not even uh, good. In fact, they are really, really associated with worse outcomes. So one should avoid that. Similarly, try to av avoid a sugar-free type of drink as well. So a lot of times they think like, oh my gosh, okay, so what happens is uh, um, I don't want to gain weight. So what they will do is they will try to take a sugar-free type of drink. So, but what happens is once a while, if you're taking it, it's okay. But if someone is trying to take it on a regular basis, it's not good. So sometimes if you take those sugar-free type of drinks, it's fine. But don't try to take it very oftenly, okay? In fact, a uh, few days back as well, I was just reading a study. It, it came from London, if I remember well. So what happened is um, they saw... Uh, that uh, so there were two group of patients of like people I would say so people one was given tea with sugar the other group was given only tea so without sugar it means so up to 10 days up to two weeks it took more time for those people who were given tea without sugar to adjust but once they controlled themselves they started appreciating the taste of the tea as well. So what I mean to say is, it has its own um, taste as well, the sugar-free uh, taste, I would say, like for example, for the drinks or the tea or the coffee as well. So if one can enjoy that, of course, it will be good for the weight loss and other things as well, okay? So the other important thing, during, especially during this time is, one should try to drink plenty of water. It not just only f is important for the rehydration, but also for the overall body's functioning and detoxification as well. And as I was already telling you, try to better to avoid sugar, but if it is becoming too, too difficult for you, you can use sugar-free sweetener. But even in that, as I said it, it's not really always you should keep on frequently using sugar-free sweetener as well, okay? And whenever you're having your diet, whenever you have to eat, so during that time, okay, you should be taking care that you're uh, trying to avoid the oily food, okay? Try to avoid those oily food or too much starchy food as well, okay? So try to take simple, easily digestible and fresh stuff. Fresh stuff like fruits, yogurts, milk, egg is also pretty fine and fish and dal or vegetables, salads as well. So they are really nice in fact. So now once we are already aware, okay, that what kind of diet one should be taking. So similarly now coming to the other important thing, what about the exercise? So about the exercise as well, the physical activity should be reduced during the daytime. During the daytime, as we all are already aware, because one is already fasting, so the calorie intake is restricted during that time. So better to avo avoid any physical activity. Similarly, the exercise can be performed. If someone is really keen on exercise, like, no, I want to do it. So once someone has already done the iftar, or tarawih prayer has been done. So after that, 
at least after a gap of around one hour, one can perform that. And um, we all should also be uh, aware that, okay, so what happens is during, especially during this time, there is increased prayer as well. So one should be careful for that as well. So now coming to our most important thing. What is the most important thing is, if someone is already taking some drugs or medicines, so what shall we be doing for that? So we will have to do some adjustments for the drug. Okay. So I'm trying to give you an overall idea, but I must suggest you try to go and visit your patients as well. Uh, I mean, sorry, your doctor. So we will try to individualize it in the best possible way. In the sense, so what happens is, a lot of times, uh, one has to be careful about the diet and exercise, which I was already telling you. Um, although during Ramadan, you know, if someone is uh, about uh, about the diet pattern, what they're using, or exercise pattern, what one is using, there's no need for any change, okay, especially during the Ramadan. What needs to be done is, you need to modify the time and intensity of the exercise. And yes, always try to ensure adequate hydration for those patients. And uh, those diabetic patients, whenever we are thinking, we, you all are very much aware that most of those patients are already on sulfonylurea and metformin, okay? So what is happening is, so if someone was already taking just a once daily dose, for example, for the glyclazide or glimiparide, okay, morning dose was there. So what you do is, during the Ramadan period, you can ask them during the iftar to take the full morning dose. But not in the morning, but as I said it, in the during the iftar, after someone has had the iftar, one can take that dose. Similarly, so for example, if someone is taking a sulfonylurea, sulfonylurea, someone is taking but a BD dose. BD dose means morning and evening. Morning and evening, someone is taking. Then what you do is, the first dose will be after the iftar, okay? That can be the morning, full morning dose. And in the suhoor will be the only half of the dosage. Similarly, as I was telling you, so, so for example, if someone is taking, okay, so now this was pretty fine. Someone is taking only once or BD, okay, we did it. What about someone is taking a metformin? Tries daily, morning, afternoon, evening to, you know, 500 mg they was taking. So what you do is, after iftar, you can give 1000 milligrams and after suhoor, what you can do is the remaining 500 milligram can be given. So a lot of times what happens is, okay, these two are the most common medications. So what are the other anti-diabetic drugs you all are aware of? Tell me. So what are the other anti-diabetic drugs? Right. And? And what else? So glitazones or glenides can be there, right? Yeah. So what happens is, so what will happen is, even uh, during the Ramadan, you try to advise them to to take it during the night time, not during the day time, okay? Otherwise, they are the ones who will be having that hypoglycemic episode. So, for example, there is a patient who was taking a pre-mixed insulin of 30 units. For example, one was taking one in the 30 units in the morning time, 20 units in the evening time. So, what you do is, after the iftar will be 30 units, but suhoor, it will be half of the dinner dose. Half of the dinner dose, for example, one was taking... 20 units, you make it as 10 units. Otherwise, if someone was taking as 40 units, then you make it half of the dinner dose. It will be 20 units, okay? Similarly, if someone was on a basal analog, so for the basal analog, you give it at the same time with 20 to 30 percent of the dose reduction. However, so if you can see it very carefully, so this is a wonderful, really a nice formula, which you can see, for example, if someone was taking a split mixed, Okay, so you really have to smartly divide it like this. So, 
you are not changing the other ones but only the last dosage what you do is of the 50 percent you try to reduce it okay so this is the key to remember this so one another important thing comes is uh, because the patient will be telling that okay can i monitor my blood sugar i'm fasting over here during ramadan and all but can i monitor my blood sugar okay please tell me about that how can i monitor that so what are the monitoring recommendations will you give as a doctor do you think monitoring should be done or not first of all should be done how So for this, the simple thing is, it, it is important, as you rightly said it, it is very, very important, in fact, because, you know, you want to recognize the subclinical, the clinical and also the subclinical, not just hypoglycemia, but also the hyperglycemia. Now, the other big question comes for this is, does the religion, so, uh, you know, Islam, does it allow, actually, someone to have uh, blood tests? while fasting. So in fact, I had asked to some of my friends and colleagues as well, they also said it, yes, it is allowed uh, for the diabetics to have regular blood tests as well, in fact, about fasting. And you must know if you are doing the testing and if someone's blood sugar is low, less than 60, fast must be broken. Because we all are aware as well, only when someone is alive, one can do or take care of their, uh, their, uh, you know, um, their religion as well. That person needs to be alive first of all. So that's why if the sugar levels are less than 60, fast has to be broken in fact. And, uh, and similarly, if the glucose level is more than 300, so what happens is, you should try to rule out diabetic ketoacidosis or other conditions in the sense like try to check for the ketones in the urine in fact and yes if someone is having then accordingly you can give medical advice as well okay i uh, okay on a little bit lighter note i'll tell you so i knew of a very smart person what they used to do is uh, they used to take the stuff but through the iv fluid Okay, and then the person used to claim that, no, no, I'm not doing any fast, uh, I mean, I'm not breaking the fast and all these things, so this is all pretty fine. So, I mean, is it's not good, in fact, that's not really the healthy or something what is called as a good practice. So, one should try to avoid thinking or doing that kind of thing. So, are you guys having any questions so far? Are there any questions? So the reason why we have tried to... Uh, this video lecture will also be there on the YouTube in fact. And what I would really suggest is try to make use of this lecture. Okay? Try to share the knowledge what you guys have got it in fact. With your friends and colleagues and also try to uh, make them aware. So. Fasting is important, okay, from the religious and spiritual point of view, but they should also be educated, they should be taught about the monitoring and the other problems as well. Not just for the normal patients, especially for those patients who are having comorbid conditions like not just the diabetes, but also hypertension or someone is having a heart problem or something else as well. So that is why... It is very important and that, this is the reason they try to say, you know, what is called a, a stitch in time saves nine. And we already even showed you a study as well, which has already proven the benefits, which is called as the read study. And there are a lot of other studies as well. So this is very important uh, if we are able to understand uh, the 
problems or if you are well educated about all these kind of things and all the chances of complications or the problems is of course going to be much less and lesser okay so are there any questions so far